evening. Good, good evening. On behalf of the American Meditation Institute, hello and welcome to the fourth and final installment of our Conversation on Your Conscience series with Leonard and Janice Perlmutter and our guests tonight, two longtime students at AMI, Dr. Anita burak Stotts and Dr. Kristen Kelber. My name is Jennifer Masters and I had the privilege of working closely with Ramlev and Janice on uh, the book, Your Conscience. If you have read the book and found it meaningful, uh, we hope that you'll consider writing a review for Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Uh, we do know that reviews matter and with holiday shopping upon us, perhaps your words will help somebody make the choice to pick up a copy. If you haven't read it yet, do give it a try and then let us know what you think. So my fellow students at AMI are familiar with our two guests. and I know all of you will join me in welcoming both Kristen and Anita. Kristen Kelber, MD, PhD, graduated from Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine and is board certified in internal medicine and pediatrics in Cleveland, Ohio. Kristen also serves as a member of the AMI Department of Medical Education and has been practicing yoga science as holistic mind-body medicine since 2015. Anita burak Stotts, MD, is also a member of the AMI Department of Medical Education. Anita is board certified in internal medicine and practices functional medicine across the river from AMI in Gilderland, New York. She earned her MD at the Medical College of Pennsylvania and completed her internship and residency in internal medicine at the Hospital of the Medical College of Pennsylvania. Anita has been a student at AMI since 2003. Thank you both for being here this evening. Janice Cortez Perlmutter will serve as the moderator of our conversation today. In addition to being the co-founder and co-director of AMI, Janice is a prolific artist and a distinguished figure in the revival of classical realist painting. Janice has had more than 40 solo exhibitions throughout the United States, and her work can be found in numerous public collections, including the New York State Museum and Skidmore College, as well as the private collections of Presidents Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton, and Her Royal Highness, Queen Elizabeth II. Finally, to those of you who may not be at AMI students, I extend a very special welcome. And I also offer this brief introduction of Leonard, author of Your Conscience and our beloved teacher. Leonard is the co-founder and co-director of the American Medica Meditation Institute and the originator of National Conscience Month. In addition to teaching at AMI, Leonard has served on the faculties of the New England Institute of Ayurvedic Medicine in Boston and the International Himalayan Yoga Teachers Association in Calgary, Canada. He's taught workshops on the benefits of meditation and yoga science at the MD Anderson Cancer Center, Kaiser Permanente, the New York Times Forum on Yoga, multiple nursing and medical schools, and the US Military Academy at West Point. Since 2009, Leonard's six-week foundation course has been certified for continuing medical education credits by the American Medical Association and the American Nurses Association. And now to our program. We will leave time at the end of the conversation for questions from the audience, so please feel free to type them into the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen at any time throughout uh, the presentation. You don't need to wait until the end. Uh, with that, Janice, I turn it over to you. Namaste. Oh, wait a minute. She muted. Is that better? That's better. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I'm very happy to have the two doctors with us. And I hope that you'll uh, be able to benefit from the wisdom that they can share with us. They have a long experience and they're both experienced meditators and very familiar with the teaching that um, we have been providing. Um, Anita has been with us for a long time, since 2003. And uh, Kristen has been with us since 2017. Both are very well versed in the, in the practices that are taught here. And tonight we're going to talk especially about how these practices and the practice of medicine relates to working with the conscience. So I hope that uh, we will be able to get some very interesting information from both of you about your experiences. Janice? Uh, yes. 
Uh, can I just cut in here just for a second? Because I think that it would be uh, important uh, to give some kind of uh, uh, honor to uh, the members of our Department of Medical Education. Uh, both Anita and Kristen serve on the Department of Medical Education. We we're very grateful for everybody's contribution. And it's interesting because our teacher, Swami Rama of the Himalayas, was instructed to come to America, to come to the United States. This is back in the late, late 60s, early 70s, in order to uh, encourage the medical community to embrace the philosophy of the East and to apply it to Western medicine and med medical principles. And so AMI was founded with that same directive. And I just want to mention the names of, of people very briefly uh, who have currently been on the Department of Medical Education. So our, our co-chairs right now, Rene Rodriguez Gudemot and Tony Santilli, and they, they are very, very dedicated. Beth Netter, who is the Chair Emeritus, whose guiding light is with us always. And then other physicians, Susan Lord, Mark Pettis, Bernie Siegel, Donna Heffernan, Jesse Ritvo, Gustavo Gunitsky is a PhD, Peggy Jacob is a registered nurse, and Mary Holloway is a med meditational therapist. And each of them, just like Anita and Kristen, are doing the same kind of work in the area of their specialty. So this is growing, and the two examples that we have here today are just magnificent, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Um, Anita, I want to start with you. I'm going to ask the same question of you, Kristen. How, what is your first memory of the conscience? How did you first hear about the conscience? And what was your impression of what the conscience uh, could do in your life? Well, thank you for the question and good evening to everyone. Um, so I've been pondering that question and realizing I can't remember a time in my life that I wasn't aware of the conscience, um, which really has to do with the, you know, the way I was raised. So I was um, brought up Catholic and um, raised in Catholic schools. And the idea of the conscience is something I honestly cannot remember um, the beginning of. So I was always aware of um, checking in with the, the voice within um, even as a small child, really. Um, and, you know, I believe that I have always carried that with me, but that the teachings of AMI have um, allowed me to understand it much better, you know, and the power of, of the conscience, um, you know, in making decisions and in um, having a peaceful and creative um, life and productive. So, you know, certainly, you know, my pre-AMI life, um, I was using my conscience, but not, um, not as completely aware of um, how helpful it is to understand the functions of the mind in the way that we, you know, we study um, at AMI and how um, powerful the techniques that we learn can be um, to focus in, you know, in a very clear laser-like way on that voice. So, um, so I hope that answers the question. I just yes. can't pinpoint a time when I didn't know about it. Thank you. I think for all of us have a much different idea of the conscience now than we did as children. Exactly. How about you, Kristen? Hello, everyone. Namaste. 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 Thank you for inviting me. I think that my earliest memory of the conscience goes back to the playground. I have a specific incident where I didn't 
listen to my conscience. I was on the playground and maybe I was in first or second grade and I kicked another kid and immediately knew that that was not the right thing to do. But as I was a child, similar to Anita, I also knew at other times in my life that things that I were doing, they may not be the most uh, pleasant, immediate thing, you know, likable thing in that moment, but I knew they were the right thing to do. Like, for example, going to practice piano. Um, I didn't really enjoy practicing piano each time, but I knew that it was the right thing to do. It was the best choice. So I have memories of thinking about, well, what would my parents want me to be doing? What would they think? That was sort of, for me as a young child, my conscience. Thank you. Thank you both. Janice, can I offer something? Sure. Uh, at the time, I, I was about three years old, and uh, we were living uh, during the summertime with my grandfather at a small little cabin uh, in Lake Luzerne, which is north of Albany. And because I always got up early, the only other person who was up uh, as early as I was, was my grandfather. And so as soon as I came to consciousness and woke up, I always ran down to his room to be with him. I loved him very much. And uh, the same situation always existed. I always found him early in the morning praying. And I, I s sat respectfully next to him as I always did. But the first time that I ever saw next to him on uh, a little table was a, a glass of water with his false teeth in it. And I looked at my grandfather, I called him Papa, and I looked at the glass with the false teeth and back and forth, and, and I said to him with bulging eyes, I said, Papa, why didn't you put your teeth in first? And he looked at me, and I do remember it like it was yesterday, although I knew nothing about the conscience. He looked at me and said, Lenny, first you pray. Then you put your teeth in. Now, I didn't know that that was my conscience, but something within me connected that there are priorities in life at certain kinds of situations. Thank you. It's interesting for all of us to consider that, how we first thought of the conscience. As there are two physicians, um, you are both of course, interested in the, in the body, the physical being. And I would like to know how the information that you have now, the acquaintance you have now with the conscience has changed the way you have addressed your own health, the way you relate to your own body. Kristen, you wanna start with this one? Certainly. Um, I, began to understand the role of the conscience from experiments that I did to try to solve my own health problems. Even before I was actually titled as a physician. Um, and they centered around food choices. And at the time, I was told by an acupuncturist, actually, to try an experiment around diet, and I was overwhelmed by her recommendation to give up all dairy and all gluten. And I thought to myself, how is that possible to do that? But I decided that I would just experiment with it. And by doing that, a certain issue that I was having improved substantially, and then some other issues improved that I didn't even know were problems. Um, and what was interesting to me is that I think in having that experience, it has been so helpful for me as a physician because I learned 
about not only about myself, but also about what is it like to be told to do an experiment like this and how could it have been a little more gentle to be asked to do this in maybe a different way. And um, I feel like one of the things that is important from that experiment that we talk about through the American Meditation Institute is that this experiential knowledge is the highest form of knowledge, meaning that once you have this happen to you, you claim it as your own. Once you experience it, it means so much more to you than if, even if a physician tells you to do something, it, it's all hearsay until you experience it yourself. That's great. That's, 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 that's very that's powerful. An important point. Yeah. What about you, Anita? About your own health and your own body? Well, um, I. I too have um, done experiments with food. Um, and, uh, you know, the funny thing in, in my own um, experience was that um, from the time I was a very young person, I um, felt very strongly that um, it was important to choose healthy food, you know, what I consider to be the, you know, healthy food. And um, actually my, my mother was a very good cook and, um, Unlike many of the the mother, I'm a baby boomer, and unlike many of the the moms of my friends at the time who you know uh, used a lot of processed food and canned stuff, my mother cooked fresh food. She um, you know cared about um, making sure we had multiple vegetables every day, and and so I I grew up with that notion about food. And uh, you know the funny thing was I I thought that I was doing really well with my food choices, you know, with the occasional. Uh, um, misstep. Um, and I did have to confront sugar at one point and uh, Coca-Cola was, a, you know, kind of an early issue that I had to deal with. Um, but, uh, you know, later in, in my life, it turned out that uh, I really had to give up gluten and dairy. Um, and I, I did not really find it difficult because for me, it was a real relief to learn um, that this was something that, you know, was a must for me, which I, you know, kind of Kind of, I won't go into how I found out about it, but um, so I'll, I'll take two examples. Though one was really my um, my Coca Cola addiction <laughs> when I was a, a younger doctor and working in a primary care practice, and and just you know being asked to see many many patients every day and falling behind, and you know um, kind of having a lag period in the in the afternoon. And uh, I found that after a while, my my um, beloved staff um, would um, suddenly a, a Coca-Cola would appear on my desk every afternoon around two o'clock or so. <laughs> Things were starting to lag. And um, it, it did take some time to figure out, I, I think I kind of knew even as I was consuming the Coca-Cola, which did you know kind of get me that little burst to not get too far behind for the afternoon, um, that this was really not such a great idea. Um, and you know, I did eventually confront that and 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 sacrifice the Coca Cola. Um, but another thing that was really important for me as a you know much younger woman was when my my daughter um, had some food issues and also you know made some choices herself. In fact, she decided to be a vegetarian when she was very young, and um, so I needed to follow my conscience. And there were a lot of voices from the outside world from the the culture, especially my family saying, you know, this is wrong, you know, she will get sick and you are a terrible mother and you should be forcing her to do something else. But I respected her choice. And I knew that, it, you know, she was doing it because of her own philosophy, even as a 10 year old. Uh, and so at the time, my conscience told me, I didn't know it was my conscience at the time, do some reading, check it out, find out how you can nourish um, a child this way. And, uh, and I did, and I was able, um, even as a young mother um, and a, a person who's very susceptible to critique from my elders, um, to lovingly thank them for their input, but make her the chickpea patties that she would eat. Uh, so that's, you know, one example. It's not, you know, exactly my health, but it was, you know, definitely um, a way of checking in and, you know, not going along with um, the many other voices that were working on me at the time. Thank you. 
So I found that, especially when dealing with changing food choices within the construct of a family, that it's critically important that we don't lose our good sense of humor. Uh, because one of the major definitions of a family I have discovered is a family is a, a unit where we all eat the same food. <laughs> That's how we know that we're a family on some level. And so people are very attached to the food that they eat. Well, not everybody has the same body constitution and capacity for digestion. I know I didn't uh, compared to uh, my, uh, my sister or my parents. And, and so th that was a challenge for me. So when I began to experiment with different food choices, and I would inevitably get pushback. It, it was not in harmony with my own conscience to, uh, to speak angry words, uh, to put other people down for their choices. And I found that the, the best tool that I had was my good sense of humor, to let them know, even though I was not going to be able any longer to eat the same item that they might be eating, I still love them. And I still was a member of this family. That kind of communication is so important in the relationships that you already have. Yeah, Even yes. if people are uh, um, not going to change with you, they at least begin to understand that it's not a threat to them personally. Mm -hmm. It's important. Um, We've talked a little bit about how you have uh, used the conscience in taking care of yourself, of your own body. But how has your knowledge of the conscience influenced the way you work with your patients? Do you have any thoughts on that? Kristen, what about you? It's such a big topic. I could go on for a two evenings. Um, I love this question. I think that the conscience plays a role in every single moment of my interaction with a patient um, on my best days. Mm -hmm. I mean, we sometimes talk about how we are clouded from our conscience and we're not listening as well as we could be. But on my best days, um, I feel like listening to your conscience and being in touch with your conscience through the bridge of yoga, knowing our own inner wisdom, allows us to have the best thought and word and action with our patients. But also it allows us to be listening well to our patient and thinking about their conscience and their, the functions of their mind and how we can best work with where they are as a human being. So I, I think it's, it's huge that through the practice of meditation, I believe I have a better listening tool to hear my own conscience so that I can make better decisions when I'm working with patients. And it's not perfect, but I'm, I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. And Thanks. being a good listener is, is a, a rare uh, skills these days, isn't it? Especially how fast the uh, the culture is going. You know, we're all traveling at 100 miles an hour in the passing lane of life, and everybody's got an agenda. And whenever we have a relationship uh, and we have an opportunity, we want to share our agenda. We want to convince others of our agenda and our perspective. But in a in a an intimate relationship like uh, a uh, a family member or uh, a physician with a patient, to be a good listener enables the physician, I, I believe, in my experience, uh, to be m much more intuitive and much more perceptive, to be able to see the mind that is making these choices. Mm -hmm. and, that's and then you can see helpful. the window that's open yes. for helping them to see that yes. there might be a different way out of their situation. That's right. You can see, because oftentimes the patient will 
have the solution in what they're telling you. Yes, absolutely. And you may you may yourself as a doctor have three or four ways that they could benefit themselves, but if they tell you one of those ways, that's the way I'm going to to work with them. That's right. What about you, Anita? You have anything to add to that? Well, I I, I love the way Kristen described um, her experience. It's so eloquent, and um, you know I completely identify with with that. Um, and uh, I was, you know, struck when I contemplated this question by um, how important um, the, the teachings and the the ability to check with the conscience has been in my efforts um, to do what um, Ram Lev has always advised me to do, which is to meet the person where they are and, and meet, you know, understand the mind of, uh, as best that you can of the person that you are trying to serve, you know. And uh, also, you know, I, to me, this concept of the conscience has been um, very integrated with, with the concept of service. Um, and with, um, with looking at um, what I do as a physician, as service, um, it, it, it's helped me to be able to check in and, uh, and quiet down internally so that I can really be my best self and be as kind as possible, um, as understanding as possible, um, to really um, be very careful um, about not uh, coming across as harsh or critical, um, which sometimes you know happens in medicine, and uh, you know it can it can be so destructive of a relationship, even just a you know one interaction that's um, you know perceived as unkind or hurtful. So I mean, not that I ever set out to hurt my patients, but I think as a younger person. Um, and especially, you know, in settings where, you know, we're rushed or hurrying or under stress, um, it, it, you know, sometimes um, is easy to slip up really, you know, and, and, and for um, a conversation to go awry or to, um, to be influenced by one's own insecurities, if that makes any sense, you know, and, and not come from a, that place of, of um, inner wisdom and you know, not using the bridge of yoga, as Kristen said. Uh, so for me, that concept of conscience, I realized as I contemplated this question, has really been about um, you know as much as possible purifying my own spirit so that I can I can meet my patients um, in a place of caring and and um, uh, concern and acceptance, you know, and love. Um, and I also find that when I am uh, able to do that when I am, you know, in that place, um, then I'm much more equipped and much more likely to be able to um, have an intuitive grasp of my patient. And maybe they are telling me what's going on or, you know, what's bothering them, or um, maybe they're really not even able to express it. But sometimes if I can be in that place of calm and, and quiet and um, wisdom, I might be able to figure it out anyway, you know, um, in an intuitive fashion. So I found that as I get, uh, you know, older, I've been more willing to trust that part of, of what I do. So um, that's been my experience. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Kristen, were you going to add to that? Uh... I, I really want to say something um, in response to what Anita said when she talked about purifying your own instrument. I think that is so important as a physician. Um, one of the things that I've found is that in, intuitively and in my own experience that something is true, I don't speak about it as faithfully to patients. So for example, during the pandemic, I decided to take on a more serious exercise regimen um, after a few months of a Tomasic life where I was more sedentary and we weren't going to the office and things like that. And at any rate, what I noticed is that I began to speak more frequently about exercise to patients 
once I started doing it, I, I had something to offer them. Um, and so I think from your own personal experience, yes, from my own personal experience. And so I think one of the things that in addition about a physician being her own physician to herself, that's so mm -hmm. critical, you know, the, the more that we can be healthy, the more it will emanate to others and make sense to others because we can speak from our own experience. And, and isn't there more power in your voice when you speak from your personal experience as opposed to what you have read or what you learned in a lecture? Yes, and it sounds more like a kind invitation. This is what I've found to be true in my life rather than a, you have to go do this sort of a thing. Yeah, yeah. May, may I offer one more, um, just one more thing in, in the subject matter? Um, so one of the things that um you know i'm a i'm a functional medicine practitioner and so as part of um almost every treatment plan um there's a, a plan for stress management and so you know i will say that um having this experience of being a meditator and being a student at ami and um you know many years of of um benefiting from from the techniques and the, the meditation um, I'm definitely on firmer ground when I recommend to my patients the the value of of stress management. Um, whether you, you know it's going to be meditation, um, it's really the the minority of patients who are going to take up a meditation practice. But you know, and I talk about this often with you guys. Um, I start with bre with breath um, with my patients, and so just having had this experience, you know, this wonderful experience of being a student at AMI. Um, and offering even a small amount of, of what I've learned through AMI, um, you know, is part of my conscience now, you know, what, what I have to offer to my patients. You know, I'm so grateful for it. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you another question and it's more uh, less about your own experience and about your own opinions, your observations of your patients. Uh, we know that for all of us, sometimes following our conscience is difficult. But I was wondering if you could um, take um, take a few minutes to uh, give us an idea of what you perceive as the reasons why your uh, patients might have difficulty with their conscience, with following the advice that you give them, for instance, and when it goes against their likes and dislikes, their ingrained habits. Can you analyze it all for us, how you think their minds might be uh, uh, working to keep them caught in the, um, in the habits that have caused their ill health? Do either of you have any thoughts that you'd like to share on that? Well, I'll start. Um, Please. I'll take this turn, Kristen. So um, I, I think there's a variety of, of reasons, you know, depending on the person. Um, but I think sometimes it's really as simple as habit patterns, you know, that are very firmly ingrained. And, um, and I always think of uh, Ramlev's story of, um, I believe it's your, the uncle who had the back pain, um, who, who, you know, would, would talk about it, his back pain all the time and say, well, without my back pain, who am I? And I honestly think for some people, um, and they, I don't think people necessarily realize this, but, the, you know, that it's, uh, you know, a real identification with um, whatever form of suffering, you know, they, they are experiencing. Uh, and it can be, can be difficult to see one's way clear that um, this can be alleviated and you can go on and then you can actually find out more about yourself rather than less about yourself. So there's that. Um, and I do think, you know, there's um, quite a bit going on in the unconscious mind. You know, another thing Ron Lev has taught me is that the unconscious will trump the conscience, <laughs> the conscious, excuse me, every time. And um, without, uh, you know, kind of digging into that, um, what's going on um, could be feelings of fear. Um, sometimes my patients are fearful of trying things that I, I recommend. Um, sometimes people are, um, feeling uh, just overwhelmed, you know, that, that you know, they, they, they are worried that they can't handle um, a treatment plan or a dietary change. 
Um, and, and sometimes people are just uh, feeling almost resentful that they have to you know, give up something, not really looking at, at, it, um, at sacrifice in the same way that we've learned to do with AMI. Um, as, uh, and uh, you know, there's this kind of um, very American, I think, way of looking at, um, uh, you know, well, it is my right to kind of you know, do whatever I want and eat whatever I want and still be vibrantly healthy. Um, you know? So I, I think there's many reasons and there's a lot of voices that are you know, crying out um, and, and competing with um, you know, that ability to connect with, I guess, you know, the physician as reflecting their conscience or you know, their own inner, inner wisdom. Um, that, that get in the way, um, you know, so I think that's uh, a multifaceted array of possible uh, reasons why that might be getting in the way, why things might be getting in the way. Before Kristen uh, uh, shares her, her thoughts, I just want to place on the table uh, something <laughs> that everybody's familiar with, and that is this marvelous quote from William Osler, who was one of the uh, three founders of Johns Hopkins University at the beginning of the last century. And Osler was, he was an intuitive uh, yoga scientist. I don't know whether he really knew anything about yoga science or not, but what he spoke uh, were definitely principles of yoga. And one of the most powerful that I have taken to heart was his comment and I think it applies in this discussion. Osler said, don't ask what kind of disease a patient has. Ask what kind of patient has the disease. So that helps to focus our energy and our attention on the habit patterns in the mind of, of the individual patient who is making these lifestyle choices that are less than skillful and are leading to some form of pain. And it's interesting that, that yoga science and Ayurveda, sister science, uh, put so much uh, emphasis on the, uh, the, the patient, on the attitudes, on the habits and the proclivities and the, and the weaknesses or strengths of, of a particular patient. That's an important part of, of the work that we're doing here. Kristen, what did you want to share on, on that subject? I, I agree with what others have said. I would add, um, I, I think a lot of the culture dictates, you know, that this is what we have for breakfast. This is what we have for lunch. This is what we have for dinner. This is what's in the grocery store to buy. Um, and the, that powerful choir of voices make it very difficult for patients to hear their own inner wisdom. Uh, we talk about the four functions of the mind, um, the senses, the unconscious mind. I'm nervous. There's one more that I'm forgetting. And then the conscience. What am I forgetting? Um, I think I'm Kara. Did you get that one? The, the ego. ego. Thank you. The ego. So oh, the, that was that, now that was a Freudian. Uh, that was a Freudian slip. <laughs> the ego did not the that. ego. The ego did not want to be exposed. Yeah, the ego did not want to be exposed. Anyhow, I mean, I think that it has a lot to do with our culture telling us in subtle ways throughout our day that this is how we're supposed to operate. Um, we're not supposed to, for example, around sleep. The idea is that if you have more work in your job, just stay up, just stay up, start that that evening of, of a big project at 9 p.m. and just stay up till midnight or 1 a.m. It doesn't matter if you don't get enough sleep. Um, we're we're encouraged to work more. Um, so I think that's one thing that blocks people from being able to make the best decision. But I also think that the senses inform the mind that this is this is the pleasant thing to do this whole concept of praya and shreya for people um which is these two types of choices that we have in our life one is the one that is 
shiny and bright and appeals to us, but may not lead to our highest and greatest good. And the other one is a more difficult choice sometimes to make the Shreya. And I think that has a lot to do with why people have trouble. Um, and then discipline plays a role. So I, I think it's very complicated. And, and I think it's important to remember that when you're working with patients to always have in the back of your mind a himza to remember that this these changes are difficult because of that powerful voice in the culture and in our um, mind. And why is that voice in the culture so powerful? Because on some level we have to recognize and, and, and we really uh, shy away from realizing this, human beings are animals and animals are prone to the herd instinct. We don't want to just be on the periphery. We want to be in the center of the herd where things are nice and secure and I'm going to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. and Do so, what everybody else is doing. That's right. So if the herd is saying, you know, stay up till the 12, 1 o'clock, it doesn't really matter, or have uh, a Coca-Cola and a, and a cigarette uh, at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning. That's, you know, whatever gets you through the day. You know, but that's problematic. That's and what other one other idea that comes to mind is this concept of Western medicine that's evolved over the last hundred years, which is that if you have a medical problem, the answer can be solved at a hospital with a pill or a surgery. Mm -hmm. And the answer is not something that you seek within to figure out what um, the, the right way is to solve your medical problem. And, and I think it's, it's so refreshing to me to work in the space that I work in with patients around their lifestyle, because they begin to learn that they, they can be their own physician. It's empowering. That's yeah. Exciting work. I just wanted to add really quickly, you know, pretty much um, complementary to what Kristen just said, that I, I do think, you know, one um, problem or, or obstruction for, for many people is just simply a lack of knowledge. And, um, you know, people are not encouraged, um, I don't think really as, as much as we might like to um, take charge of their own health and, uh, you know, be proactive um, and um, be in the mode of preventing, you know, not getting to the point where, um, you know, Dr. Mark Hyman says, um, you know, you can wear the jersey, you know, you have, now you have this disease, you know, you can claim to have an autoimmune disease or diabetes or, um, you know, whatever it is. And now we have a, a remedy for that. Um, the concept that, um, you know, it's really not, you know, one day you're fine and the next day you have diabetes, um, but that, you know, your body is changing over time and that it's possible to intervene. Um, I just don't think people learn this really. You know, I, I it took me quite a while to learn um, that concept, uh, even as a physician. So, so I do think, you know, it's really important um, to be willing to continue to educate the people that we work with. And, you know, um, so that's, that's the, speaks to the importance of a webinar just as <laughs> we're for, for participating in tonight, uh, because uh, if you take a look at now television, for example, uh, when I was a kid, we had three channels. Now there are like 3000 channels and, and, you know, we, and now we have these remote control little uh, uh, gadgets that you can just click a button and uh, you, you go from one channel to the other, to the other, to the other. And did you ever go through uh, all the channels uh, at a time? And, and what do you find? Do you ever find uh, a conversation like this on, on uh, the television? Rare, very, very rare. Mm -hmm. So the work that you two in particular are doing every day is tremendously important because it has impact far beyond 
your own family, your own self, your own patients, because other people see what you're doing as well, and we might never even meet them. That's an important point. It's true for all of us, but working as you do as physicians with patients who are who have have troubling conditions, that that makes them very uh, open in a different way to your influence, uh, different, more receptive than uh, the most of the relationships that we have. And it can influence the nurses you work with, Definitely. the administrators you work with. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Back to the subject of the conscience, uh, the new book, Your Conscience, Ramlev's new book, uh, is divided into several very practical chapters. And I was wondering, uh, I'd like to hear from both of you about what particular chapter or incident or idea from the book has been most meaningful to you. Anita, you want to start with this one? Well, I'm looking for the, uh, you know, so here's my book with all the little, you know, markers. <laughs> so I need to find uh, the one that I, there, there was, so I chose one that I wanted to share um, and I should have marked my little paper better. Um, you want Kristen? But essentially, start? well, if Kristen is ready and I, I, I can paraphrase it even if I can't find it. Well, why don't you hang on and-, and yeah, Kristen, let, let's hear from you first. It's hard to know what is the most impactful about the book, but since we were speaking about our work with patients, I really love the first beginning of the book where it's a call to humanity, but especially two parts. And then I'll try to be brief. Um, the first is a quote from Joseph Campbell, and I'll explain why I really like this quote, it says, a bit of advice given to a young Native American at the time of his initiation. As you go the way of life, you will see a great chasm. Jump. It's not as wide as you think. And I like that quote very much because when I work with patients, I talk with them about experiments. And as I mentioned before, when I was asked to make a food experiment in my own life, I found, I thought, well, there's no way I'm going to be able to do this. But I use that idea when I'm working with patients to say, just try it out. Just try it out for a day. Try it out for a week. See what you can do with this. So I think that's a very important concept when working with patients that it, it seems like it's going to be too hard to do, but it really, in many cases, is very rewarding if they can just make that initial jump. And then on the same page, I, I just think that this is encapsulates the book. Um, Leonard writes, the conscience gives us the confidence to know what what's to be done and what's not to be done, no matter what challenge we face. But our ignorance of the power of the conscience blinds us and leads to suffering. And, and I think that, that those two sentences really talk about why this book is so important and why I encourage people to read the book. I've even had, since its September publication, two patients read the book and we've actually, with one person, begun to look at some of the experiments in the back of the book. So. Great. Good. Thank you. Anita? Well, I will say that that is definitely one of my favorite passages also, Kristen. Um, so um, I chose this uh, passage on page 67 where there's a quote from St. Francis. Um, it is in dying um, and in quote, in. Um, parentheses to the separate sense of self that we are born to eternal life. Um, so this really resonated with me. You know, we've, we talk about this quote often in, you know, in our um, classes and prior to being 
um, a student at AMI, um, I, I always thought that what this meant was actual death, you know, that once, you know, we actually die and move on to the next life, um, you know, that we we're so I was always kind of interpreting it fairly literally. Um, but the meaning now that, you know, I've learned is that it's really in, in um, dying to our limitations, you know, to our, our, our own sense of how our, our limitations and our, um, you know, our smaller self, that we can be aware of um, our eternal self, our true self. And, and I think it's so beautiful um, and so inspiring. And it's something uh, that I, you know, would hope for, for, um, you know, the people that I come in contact with. And, uh, you know, it's funny, I kind of wish that I had um, quoted this more often. I probably haven't really quoted it to my patients, honestly, but it, it's such a beautiful thought. And, you know, certainly for me personally, and uh, just to keep in mind that um, everyone that we encounter, every other person is this true self of, um, you know, eternal consciousness, wisdom, and bliss. Um, that's really who we all are. And um, so that is very meaningful to me um, and very beautiful. So that was the one that I chose. Thank you. We have a little bit of time left. Um, the audience is free to ask questions. I have not received any, but uh, we would be very happy to uh, answer whatever questions might be coming in. And if there are no other questions, we can... Uh, we can just speak. <laughs> we can just speak. <laughs> I want to thank both of you for being with us. I, and I, I thank our audience, too, uh, because each of us has uh, influence uh, far beyond our, our imaginations. If we can take these ideas out into our lives, it will help everyone, starting with us, ourselves. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Yes, thank you for inviting um, me in. Thank you for your participation and sharing your experiences with us. Thank you all. And for the life you're living. Yes. And how you are serving so many people, seen and unseen. Thank you. Thank you. So Jennifer? Oh, here's a question. Uh, just a thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate your, receptive, your, your receptiveness for all of this. Hi, Janice. Um, I actually see, can you hear me? Yes. I see a few questions also. I, yes, I do see a couple of questions. So could you? I suspected that. Jennifer, do you want to read the questions? Sure, sure. Um, so... This is a question from Lisa, who says that she's been noticing lately, um, I'm just going to read this. I've been noticing lately as the doctor's notes in my portal, the patient portal, have become less relatable to my own true experience of myself. That Lisa says she's increasingly feeling that disease doesn't have to be my reality. And I want to resist living in that narrow and often, often frightening view of myself. This is, this is feeling different than denial to me. Any comments about that? Um, I, I would say to Lisa that um, I think it, you know, I don't know if, uh, if Lisa is a meditation student or not, but I would say that it sounds like the, the dawning of um, her, her self introspection, her asking herself who she who she really is. Um, you know, I've been diagnosed with a you know disease, but I am not the disease. And then you know she can take that farther. If she's interested. If she reads the book, um, and she'll see very clearly because Ramlev has beautifully 
written about how to do that process. So I think that's um, wonderful that Lisa is having this realization and uh, she may be able to help um, educate her physicians also. Uh, you know, there used to be kind of an, uh, an old joke, you know, I'm old enough to um, have lived this also that, um, you know, doctors would refer to, you know, the gallbladder in room th 342 and the pneumonia in, you know, room 576 um, and really depersonalize patients that way. And, you know, we could have a whole webinar about that. Um, but Lisa, I think you're on the right track and I would encourage you to use the procedures in the book to, to keep going, uh, going with that exploration. Thank you. The, body, the body wants to be healthy. The body wants to be healthy. The body wants to seek homeostasis and balance. And what, what is disturbing that? What is disturbing that is the, are the habits of the mind. Mm -hmm. So uh, assuming that uh, the disease has not gone to such an extent, uh, the more that you can change lifestyle choices, change things you like and things that you don't like. For example, today, I don't eat the food that I loved when I was 13. Today, I eat food that loves me, that loves my eyes, that loves my heart, that loves my pancreas, that loves my muscles and my joints. Mm -hmm. So it's about beginning this process of self-examination. What are the obstacles to my health that are present in, in my unconscious mind in the form of things that the personality likes and the things that the personality does not like? Because that can be a prison, not only for my mind, but also for my body. Thank you. And I'll ask the, this one other question that we have, which is um, sort of specific. So I'm not sure how, you, how, how you'll respond to this, but is there a, can you talk about um, maybe in general terms, using the power of meditation and maybe some work with the chakra system for conditions like anxiety or high blood pressure? Well, certainly uh, meditation uh, is, is very, very helpful for high blood pressure because it uh, focuses our mind on one object and that creates a relaxation response mentally and physiologically. But I'm sure the, the docs can speak in, in uh, more uh, co cogent terms than, than that. Just the other day, I was speaking with someone who was suffering from anxiety, and I spoke about one-pointed attention with them, about how we often have a task that we're asked to work on, and our energy ideally would come at that task like this. But what happens is that some of our energy is veering off towards our grocery list and veering off towards the past and veering off into, I got to go do this. And that really creates anxiety for people. And one of the benefits of beginning to learn how to have one point of attention through the practice of meditation is that in the other parts of your life, you are more able to channel all of your energy towards the task at hand. And it doesn't come tomorrow, like after one meditation, I haven't found that immediately does it come. But as you work with one pointed meditation, mantra meditation, which is what we practice at the American Meditation Institute, I have found that I can be more focused on the task at hand and that this lowers your blood pressure. Um, there are hundreds of studies showing that meditation is beneficial for these two conditions. I would, I would agree. Um, uh, and I would add that um, for people who are students or interested in becoming students, AMI offers a, a course on the chakras um, that is, you know, can be very helpful for somebody who wants to learn more how to use um, that system 
And uh, I will just say that um, some years ago, I, I undertook a task to research which conditions um, there's actually um, good clinical evidence uh, to support the use of, of meditation. Um, and uh, high blood pressure was really the top of the list, you know, extremely well documented. Uh, and, so, you know, some of the benefit that can be obtained. And, you know, it has to be, you know, people really have to meditate um, and, and stick with it. Um, but uh, the, the amount of decrease in the blood pressure is something that any doctor would be very happy to get with a medication, you know, with, with pharmaceuticals. Um, so it, it, it can definitely be done. Um, you know, obviously, you need to work with your doctor and make sure that you're safe, you know, that you don't need some other intervention at the same time. But Yes, it, it can be very helpful. Yes, I think it's important to say that we are not this person's doctor. We're not offering right. Right. specific medical advice. Well, thank you so much. And I am so pleased that one of you is my doctor. <laughs> it has made such a huge difference in my life um, working with you. And uh, everything that you said um, comes through in how you work, uh, how you work with me as your patient. Um, and it's really, um, it's such a gift what, what you're doing. So thank you so much. And thank you for being here tonight. Um, I want to let everybody know that we will have a recording posted within the next week or so on the AMI website and YouTube channel. And you can also find um, uh, recordings there of past conversations that we have had. So on behalf of AMI, we wish you a blessed and joyful Thanksgiving holiday with your friends and your family. And we invite you to consult with your conscience when that second piece of pie comes around um, into your awareness. So we will be in touch in the next few weeks and months uh, with upcoming events related to the third annual National Conscience Month. Thank you again for choosing to be here with us tonight. Namaste and good evening. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, Anita.